Hello, welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester, I'm the Director of Public Programs, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to tonight's perf uh, performance and panel, Remapping the Middle East Playlist. It's really wonderful for the Hammer to be part of this exciting week-long pro program called Listening to the Other Mid-East Musical Dialogues. I want especially to thank uh, Neil Stolberg of the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music, and Neil Brostoff, the musical impresario, who's going to be our moderator here tonight. Welcome. So nice to see all of you. Um, I'm Neil Brostoff, and I want to start by thanking Claudia Bester and the Hammer Museum uh, for making this uh, evening possible, and also my partner in crime, Neil Stolberg, who uh, is not able to be here because he's involved with a orchestral rehearsal, which actually has nothing to do with our, uh, of our wonderful week-long project. So he's over at UCLA now. Um, I, I want to give you a quick overview of the project, a really very quick overview. And it is that um, close to two years ago, I came across the name of a young composer in New York, Mohammed Fairuz, who I, whose name I did not know. And uh, uh, learning of his interests in Jewish text uh, and Jewish music to some extent um, uh, led me to uh, thinking of, of a, an idea of, of a small program in which Mohammed's music and the music of some Israeli composers who were very interested in Arabic texts and Arabic poetry could be brought together, and maybe one lecture. And that tiny kernel of an idea in February of last year has now blossomed into this week-long uh, program. So uh, I'm, I'm, it's, uh, it, it's been a real journey, and uh, uh, we just really started last night. The first public program was last night with a recital uh, with David Krakauer, who was with us this evening, and uh, and uh, some chamber music, and it was a blowout, um, unbelievably wonderful concert. We have a concert tomorrow night, uh, also at Schoenberg uh, Auditorium, Schoenberg Hall at UCLA, and, uh, and a concert at Royce Hall, as I think you know, on December 8th, Sunday evening at 7 o'clock, um, pre-concert talk at 6 o'clock. Um, and at that concert on Sunday, we will hear more music of uh, Mohammed Fairuz and also the early 20th century Russian Jewish composer Alexander Crane. Um, I want to thank the participants who are speaking tonight. I am um, I am in awe of their uh, um, of their expertise, of their musical abilities, of their scholarly abilities, and I want to just quickly mention each of their names, even though you could see it in in your programs. So uh, closest to where I'm standing. Uh, at, at your left um, is Betty Olivero, who has uh, come all the way from Israel. Uh, she's a fine composer. I've known her work for some time. Um, and uh, she came here 10 years ago, also to Los Angeles, uh, for a festival that I organized called Beyond Bim Bam, New Directions in Jewish Music. Uh, next to Betty is Mohammed Fairuz, the composer that I just talked about. Uh, and then, uh, next to Mohammed is Ben Brenner, Benjamin Brenner, who is an ethnomusicologist who has studied fusion groups, who has really studied um, studied the possibilities in cross-cultural collaboration uh, in Israel going back to the early 90s, uh, 1980s, especially the group called Bustan Avraham. Uh, and then to your right is, uh, is Thaher um, Bader, who is also one of the panelists and is a superb um, superb uh, Udist, uh, and uh, he's going to play now for about five minutes uh, some improvisations, and then uh, and then we'll do some talking. So you know, people. Uh, just one one more word to say about this. Somebody said to me earlier, I think it was Betty. This should be eighty five percent music. Uh, it should be a lot more music than talking about music. But it reminds me of something that I've always wanted to say to an audience like this. That I once heard Ingolf Dahl, the the the, the late beloved composer and composition professor at USC, speaking to an audience before a concert. And um, uh, Dahl was Swedish, and he said, if a Swede walks down a path and comes to a crossroads, comes to a fork in the road, and there's a sign that says, paradise to the right, 
and lecture on paradise to the left. The Swede will always go to the left to the lecture on paradise. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so we will be treated now to some um, improvisations uh, on the oud with Tha uh, Eric Bader. <laughs> Er is now joining us as a, as a panelist, and he's going to speak first. Um, and what I want to first ask Thayer to do is tell us, uh, Thayer is from, from, the, um, from the Arabic community that's known as uh, Druze, and you might not all know who the Druze people are. With English letters, we spell it D-R-U-Z-E. Um, but Thayer is, is Druze, uh, and he was uh, the solo oud player in 
a, an orchestra called the Arab Jewish Youth Orchestra. So I'd like him to talk a little bit about um, his community and about his experiences, what he came away from that experience of, um, of, of being the solo oud and the principal oud player in the Arab Jewish Youth Symphony um, not that long ago. Uh, thank you, Neil. Good evening, everybody. Um, the Druze community is, um, is a small community inside the Arab minority, uh, which has its main instinctive beliefs, which is the main one, the reincarnation of the spirit. It has a philosophic meaning. Um, it's not actually a religion. It's a current that's split it from uh, actually, they've taken many things from Judaism, from Christianity, from Islam, and they've started their uh, their current like forty thousand, I think. And this is the main distinctive uh, belief they, be they believe in. Of, as I said, the reincarnation of the spirit, and they live in a minority inside the minority of the Arabs in Israel. So we are minority inside a big minority in Israel. So this is about it uh, in general. So if you can tell us about um, your, your experiences in the orchestra. Uh, Thayer was a, was a student of Taysir Elias, who uh, founded the Arab Jewish Youth Orchestra, and which I realized recently there are three different orchestras that lay claim to being the uh, Arab Jewish Youth Orchestra, each with a different director and a different year of its founding. Uh, but the one that, and all in Jerusalem, but the one that uh, Thayer, uh, Thayer played in is one that was directed by Taysir Elias, who actually uh, we had planned to bring here, and he had an injury to his finger on his, on his left hand and had something called Jersey finger as a result, a, a damaged tendon. Uh, and then he suggested that that we bring his his student, his former student that are here. So if you could talk a little bit about that, that experience of being in the orchestra, that would be, I think um, we'd want to hear that. First of all, the, the idea just, um, I've been convinced by the idea that through music we can just uh, break too many barriers uh, between both cultures because the, the orchestra I played in contained Western uh, musicians and Eastern musicians, um, which we played. We the Taysir, my professor Taysir has made arrangements for both uh, pieces from the Eastern cla Arabic classical music and the Western classical music. So the main idea was to break b the to go through the barriers with the the huge conflicts that's going in the Middle East. So I was the Oud soloist for three years with, with him. OK, <laughs> thank you. Um, we, we have a video clip of, of this. Thank you. 
Gabriel Fauré, as you've never heard his music before. <laughs> um, I'd, li I'd like to now introduce uh, Ben Brinner, um, uh, who is an ethnomusicologist who, as I mentioned, uh, um, made, um, uh, has a specialty or had a specialty uh, in, um, in studying the er some of the early fusion bands um, in, in Israel going back to the 1980s and did a great deal of field work there. Uh, he's now at, uh, at our um, sister, uh, sister campus, the University of California, Berkeley, and he's chair of the music department there. So Ben Brinner. Thank you. So I was teaching in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv in the mid-80s, and Taisir Ilyas was one of my students, and he was also a teacher in a program I ran to teach um, what was called non-Western music. It was the first program of its kind in Jerusalem at the Jerusalem Music Center, uh, which Isaac Stern had founded. And uh, so I met Taisir in several guises. He was my master's student in ethnomusicology. He was my employee as a teacher of, of uh, Arabic song and oud. And he was my teacher on oud. And also he was my student in Javanese gamelan. So we interacted in many, <laughs> many different ways. Um, I think he's the first Arab violin player to ever transfer his skills to a, a, a vertical uh, <coughs> Indonesian rabab. Um, when I came back to Israel in the early 90s on visits, uh, I found that uh, Taisir and uh, several other Arab musicians I knew had started to collaborate with Jewish musicians in a new kind of music, a new field of music. And they weren't all doing the same thing, but I was struck by this area of activity which sprang up before the Oslo Accords, but really gathered steam after it. So there's roots in the 80s, but really this is a phenomenon of the 90s. And so I'll just say a few words on who, what, and why uh, it, it was involved in this. Um, and it, it really generated a remapping of the Middle East playlist. Not my title, uh, Niels, but it, it, it works. It definitely works. Um, these people did not become the most popular musicians in the Middle East or even in Israel, but they started to be heard, and they were playing something that hadn't been heard before. There had been many different involvements of Jews and Arabs over the years, over the centuries, even in music, but nothing like this had happened before. So what we have here in the 1990s, uh, beginning in Israel, is a coming together of musicians with very different backgrounds, with um, some of them being very cosmopolitan, knowing numerous styles of music, uh, either playing them themselves or at least open to them, others being very, very focused and having very different assumptions about what it means to perform together, what, how musicians should play together, what, whether there should be notation, all sorts of questions like that. And uh, what, what's the appropriate setting for music? Should it be on a stage? Should there be a curtain? Should there be applause? Uh, should it be at a party in a nightclub or in a concert hall? And uh, they brought together a mix of many different kinds. So Middle Eastern music of some sort, Arab, Persian, Turkish, was always at the core, but always in combination with at least one other kind of music, and often two, three, four. Um, one, not, none of them necessarily Israeli or necessarily Jewish, uh, although sometimes one or the other. Uh, don't ask me to define Jewish music, please. And um, often uh, European classical music, uh, often jazz, sometimes blues, sometimes flamenco, um, sometimes klezmer, a, a really a, a variety depending on who the musicians were and what their interests were. So they were putting these together and they created a kind of music that sits very uncomfortably in the intersection of art, folk, and popular musics, which are themselves pretty difficult or problematic categories, which caused them problems in marketing their music. A lot of people didn't know how to sell their music, and a lot of other people didn't know how to, how to advertise them if they were pu uh, putting on a concert. Um, and this is, so I just want to get you to bear in mind that this is not a simple matter of Jews bringing Jewish music and Arabs being, bringing Arab music. There were many Jewish Jews who played Arab music. They were Arab Jews in some sense and there were many Arabs who played other kinds of music, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the why, the why of this, um, there, there were numerous reasons, and let, let me go into a little history here, but um, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons was certainly political. So there were, was an idea of, particularly at the time of the Madrid talks in 1991, and then the Oslo Accord in 1993, that brought glimmers of hope, or more than glimmers of hope, for a peaceful accord between uh, Israelis and Palestinians, that there was this idea that making music together, as in 
uh, we just heard, was going to break down barriers and bring people together. Uh, but most of the musicians I, I worked with, and I wrote a book about them, which features some of them on the cover. Um, it's called Playing Across a Divide. I didn't just specify which divide. There are so many different divisions. Um, many of these people got into it because the music was so exciting. And I, I tried to always keep that in mind. Politically, it was enticing. People wanted to promote this. Sometimes politically, it was a problem. And even when the musicians said they weren't in it for politics, they were always read as being political. There was no way to escape that. Um, and so just a few words on wh why this happened at the time that it did. Um, so we have in the 1980s an opening up of Israel and the Israeli public to the, the rest of the world in a way that was kind of unprecedented. M many, many Israelis were starting to travel to Asia and to Africa to a much greater extent than had been possible before, and they were encountering other kinds of music. We have um, the breakdown of the Soviet Union and the, uh, the immigration of Central Asian Jewish music, uh, musicians from the former Soviet Union uh, coming to Barilan and teaching uh, Central Asian music, Uzbeki, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and so on. Um, and we have uh, world music, the world developing world music market, and musicians in Israel saying, wait, th those people are doing something I could be doing too, and this is a market that I could be making music in. Um, we have a long history of Israeli composers dating back before the foundation of the State of Israel, taking elements from Jewish ethnic, different Jewish ethnic groups and from Arab music, but that kind of had, had died down a bit, and it saw a rebirth of interest in the 1980s. And uh, we have a growing phenomenon of Israeli popular music called Musika Mizrahit, which is a, a popular music coming from really the margins of society, bringing together popular musics from around the Middle East and the, and the Mediterranean. All of these converged and uh, created a climate in which there was much more interest in this kind of music. And for Arab musicians, Palestinians living in Israel, Israeli citizens, Palestinian musicians living in the West Bank, and to perhaps also in, in the Gaza Strip, although I didn't do work there, there was a sense that here was some new possibilities for making music. There was a kind of stagnation in local Arab musical life. There weren't enough opportunities to play. There wasn't a whole lot of new music going on. This was a way out. And then there was the first Intifada, the first uh, Palestinian uprising, which really limited performance. So, this whole phenomenon emerged out of a combination of interests, frustrations, new possibilities. Um, and do I have time for another comment or two? Yeah, a, a little bit. Okay. Let, let me just uh, say, so, so what this did for the performers uh, was it opened, up, opened them up to exposure to, to different musical uh, processes, different ideas about how to make music, it gave them a sense of creating something together, which is rather different from what we just saw, not to devalue at all what, what we just saw, but, and I don't have a clip to play for you, but um, these people, the most creative among them at least, and Taisir was certainly one of the most creative, would, were creating a new means of musical expression that had recognizable elements taken from various places. But, but was something original. And they took great pride, they still take great pride in this, and this set in motion a, uh, a musical movement. Um, I think one of the most important things, though, that they did was exactly what this orchestra was doing, which was embodying the possibility of coexistence and of actually mutual assistance in doing something new and, and culturally val valuable. So Arabs and Jews being on a stage, making music together, trusting one another, speaking together. I can say more later if we have an opportunity. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that Ben just mentioned something that he did because there is um, there's a world of difference between the bands that really created a kind of um, a new syncretisms in music, a hybrid, hybrid that came from all these different um, Greek and other Mediterranean backgrounds and um, from different Arab music cultures and Jewish um, and something like the Arab Jewish Youth Orchestra which in the clip that we saw of course was playing a piece of, of um, you know uh, late 19th century French music on, um, on non-western uh, instruments but it also reminds me of something that I learned from Thayer yesterday that, that impressed me so much that he, he, that he knows some Hasidic tunes and he sang them to me. And, um, and I, I suppose that he's played them on the oud, but there's, there's a real disconnect between East European 
Jewish music uh, and um, and Arab Arab instruments. But maybe maybe it's not such a disconnect. I'm not sure. But now I want to, I, actually I want to ask uh, Mohammed Fayrouz, uh, my my new friend from. Um, uh, going back to about a year and a half ago, but I only met him for the first time a few weeks ago. He's made a number of trips to Los Angeles very recently. Uh, and I, I want to ask him to speak about his, his visions, his work, um, and the things that, uh, that really brought us together with this rather mammoth project that's underway uh, this week. So, Mohammed. Momo is his nickname. I'm not sure how he got that nickname, but uh, and that's what we've been calling him. I think the, the <coughs> ad, uh, acquisition of the nickname is fairly obvious. But um, what's less obvious is are, are some of the questions that are being raised today and, and um, over the last several weeks, I've made many, many trips to LA. Um, and I, I want to talk a little bit about the main reason um, and, and the main reason I was making those trips. It's because um, something really extraordinary is happening right now, here, this week. Um, and uh, I want to start by, uh, th uh, you know, th uh, acknowledging the some 300 or so um, students at UCLA, a couple of, couple of hundred people in the choir, over a hundred people in the orchestra that are putting together, you know, the West Coast premiere of my third symphony, Poems and Prayers. I, I see some of you here today, and uh, thank you. Thank you for, for doing this. Um, I want to point out something else that, that recently happened is that, you know, as I've said, I, um, even though Neil um, and I connected fairly recently, um, for many years I've, I've been known to um, make the circuits among our symphony orchestras. And uh, I had an offer uh, from a fairly major symphony after the premiere, after the world premiere of Poems and Prayers, uh, to do uh, the West Coast premiere. And I won't name the major symphony orchestra, and I'll say it's not the LA Phil, but that leave it at that. And I agreed to it, and then afterwards, um, this offer came from UCLA. And I said to myself, we have to give UCLA the West Coast premiere. And some of you might think I'm insane. Um, so I contacted the symphony. I made sure it was OK. They delayed the performance by a few months. Um, so I guess you can find out who this is if you look. <laughs> but um, uh, one of the reasons why I did this is because uh, of something that happened in um, rehearsal uh, I guess yesterday in the in the in the orc with the orchestra, there is a passage in the final movement of Poems and Prayers that the or, that the um, the uh, uh, flutist plays in collaboration with Sasha Cook, one of our finest mezzos, who's here and I'm mean, listening to me sitting right next to David Krakauer. I mean, my mind is blown. Um, but anyway, I I the flutist the student flutist comes up to me and she says, you know, I've been reading the Amichai poem, <laughs> which is something you don't hear very often in an orchestra setting, you know. An instrumentalist saying, well, I've read the poem that you've set in this piece, you know. Um, uh, and then saying, well, I realized, you know, that the passage about the flutist's mouth and all of that stuff is the passage that you've set with uh, me and Sasha singing. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? If, I've been getting this all week, this tremendous amount of um, intellectual stimulation, curiosity, the real reason for sort of making art that resonates beyond the concert hall and r a real engagement with that. Now, I also want to acknowledge the fact that there's a very, very high level of musical excellence that's happening here, um, which is, you know, Poems and Prayers is a hard piece, 60 minutes long, the symphony. I mean, it's, it's my kitchen sink symphony. There's everything in it. Um, and uh, I've, you know, I've come beyond calling these students kids, and, and I'm, I, I'm calling them young professionals. They're, they're, they're giving it their all. The choruses are giving it their all. 
And uh, so I'm, I'm extremely proud to be here this week to put together the West Coast premiere um, of Poems and Prayers with 300 and something or so of your very, very, very special young people in LA and to share my vision. And my mind is absolutely, absolutely blown by the fact that I have the tremendous privilege of sharing poets like Yehuda Amichai, Mahmoud Darwish, Fadwa Tukhan, with, with some people who have never heard of these poets and have never read these poems and, and really did not know Yehuda Amichai. I mean, I get to introduce young people to Yehuda Amichai. That's really exciting. Guys. And uh, so this week has really, thank you, it's really reinforced my um, perspective that I have, if not the best job in the world, at least one of them. Thank you. Um, we have a, a short video clip, which is taken from uh, Mohammed's um, website. And I think it's useful and it's instructive uh, to see this because we learn a little bit more about the Poems and Prayers Symphony, his third symphony, and also the, um, another work that we'll hear on Sunday evening uh, at Royce Hall, which is called Tahrir, uh, in commemoration of the events in Tahrir Square, um, the beginning of the, of the uh, Arab Spring. And um, in that video clip, we will see uh, David Krakauer uh, and Mohammed in conversation, and it's about six minutes long, and I, but I think it's really useful um, it would be good for us to see that. So if we could run that. by the Center for Middle East Peace, Culture, and Diplomacy to create a piece interweaving Jewish and Arabic traditions. My interactions with the poets involved, Mahmoud Darwish, Fadwa Tukhan, and Yehuda Amichai, were very personal. In this piece, I thought to interweave that and use the common thread of the prayer ritual to bring all these things together. The piece begins, which is an ancient Aramaic prayer. which just means he who makes peace in the high places make peace for us and upon all Israel. And that's how the first movement sort of reaches its culmination. And that's immediately followed by the second movement, which is a setting of Mahmoud Darwish, a fragment from a larger poem called State of Siege. And it's a lullaby. And initially you think it's a love poem. Um, and then you realize at the very end that it's actually a mother singing to her dead son. And the dead son is characterized in the figure of the solo clarinet.
and that ends in a much more open-ended way. You don't have a wrapped up chord like you do at the end of each of the movements that end with Amen. And then that's followed by this interlude, which is a minyan, which is the quorum of adult Jewish men who come together to pray, followed by what is the third movement, the setting of Fadwa Tukan, the great Palestinian poet's wonderful poem about not being able to write. And here she's accompanied by a solo violin. And then we have another interlude, which is a setting again of the Ose Shalom. The women are for the first time given the ability to sing, and there's a certain tenderness to the music at this point, and it's much more honest. Part of the reason why I wanted to use choir is because choirs are consistent of everyone your local baker, your local banker, the whole community can come and join in a choir. Having a choir made up of Arabs and Jews and, and, and everyone else, a true reflection of the community itself would be an excellent thing. This is followed by the fourth movement, which is the finale. This big finale is a setting of Yehuda Amichai's Memorial Day for the war dead. The crux of the Amichai poem is this line, behind all this some great happiness is hiding. The movement eventually ends up breaking back into the Ose Shalom. Val kol yoshvei tevel is added. Those lines just means and for all the nations of the world so that we're praying for peace, not only for the tribe, but for everyone. Immersing them with the choir, with the solo voices, with the solo instruments, with the orchestra, it creates an atmosphere. That could in itself be the message of peace. We are indeed fortunate to have two um, superstar uh, musicians in, uh, uh, here in Los Angeles with us now to participate in the concert on uh, Sunday evening, December 8th, uh, and who have also uh, been brought together as sort of champions of Mohammed's music, I think is, is a fair characterization. Uh, and the, the movement of the Third Symphony, of the Poems and Prayer Symphony for clarinet uh, and mezzo soprano, we will now hear and it's uh, in, in performed live by Sasha Cook, mezzo soprano, and David Krakauer. There it is. Something about this before they. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I wasn't going to say anything about this piece, uh, but Sasha encouraged me to say something, um, because I told this to her at the dinner table before beforehand and she said I didn't know and then she said you should probably tell the audience and then I was like well they don't want to really hear it and then Betty said actually you really should and so two votes um, which is that the, the poem this is a poem from as you heard a larger 
set of poems, an epic poem by Mahmoud Darwish called The Stage of Siege. And um, I first read this poem, I was visiting the Middle East and I was on a bus ride from um, Damascus to Beirut, which believe it or not, is about two hours. And uh, I, Mahmoud Darwish is known as an avant, was known as a very avant-garde poet. Uh, he wrote in free verse, he broke all the boundaries. So I started reading this poem, It read like Ghazal, like that ancient form of Arabic uh, love poetry from about a thousand years ago. And I said, what the heck is this? You know, this is, this is the most progressive poet, and he's writing in these rhyming verses. And of course, I then came, if you'll not be a rain, my love, be a tree. If you'll not be a tree, be a rock, be a moon. Very tender, very lyrical. We came to the last line, and he breaks out of the free verse, out of the uh, rhyming verse, and he writes, and this is what a woman said to her son at his funeral, in very modern, you know, it's like a, it's like T.S. Eliot's cold showers, you know, that what Lenny Bernstein used to call T.S. Eliot's cold showers. Um, uh, so. Uh, like a patient etherized on table, <laughs> that sort of, yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm lucky if one person's laughing. Um, so uh, uh, I then contacted Mahmoud Darwish and I said, I really want to set State of Siege to music. It's a big piece, you know. And he said, Oh, sure, and you know, we'll talk about it. We'll, you know, you'll uh, get to pick my brain on it. And and I'm going to be in New York for the. Edward Said Memorial Lecture, I'm going to give a poetry reading. He came to the States, and they flew him to Houston, and he died of a heart attack. And um, and I was, at the time, working uh, on commission of, for my first opera, um, Sumedha's Song, and I just dropped it, and I gravitated to, to this poem, and I immediately set it to music. Uh, so this is this that's a little bit of the context behind this piece, and 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 I have to say that Sasha and David are, um, I mean, I'm so, so, so happy with the way you're singing this. It's just, you know, we're like, composers are like countries, al although perhaps more noble. And these are our great ambassadors. <laughs>
in my first conversation with Mohammed, which was again February of last year, um, uh, and these rushes of ideas were were coming into my head. But one of the things that uh, that immediately I thought of was to to uh, a parallel to what a, a kind of parallel to what Mohammed was doing um, with with Jewish text that might include the work of two Israeli. Jewish composers that I've been uh, I've been fans of their music for many many years, and I uh, both of them have come uh, to Los Angeles uh, in connection with uh, with concerts I've arranged of their music during the last 20 22 years. Uh, Tzipi Fleischer, who is in Haifa, uh, and sitting next to me, Betty Olivero. Then Betty teaches at Bar Ilan University, teaches composition, studied at Yale with Luciano Berio, uh, and. Um, um, both have made wonderful contributions to Israeli art music, Israeli classical music, but often referencing music of it's it's kind of nationalistic music in a way one one could say I mean but Bart, when Bartok was writing nationalistic music it was of music of of his heritage and of neighboring communities uh, and Copeland's and Ives's nationalistic music is American folk music and barn dances and jazz and all kinds of things. But when Betty and Sipi um, have written music that I'm not sure it's really appropriate to call it nationalistic, they have, they, they have incorporated Middle Eastern accents into their music from um, from communities that are not that are not Jewish communities, and this has always been very interesting to me, especially their use of text. So, um, so I'd like to um, to ask Betty to speak a little bit about her work, uh, and then we will listen also to uh, to a short CD of. Uh, part of one of the works that we're going to hear in chamber music concert tomorrow night, and we will also hear a live performance uh, of of an improvisation on that um, uh, actually Yemenite Arabic uh, song sung by Odeya uh, Nini, who is also with us. So Betty, please. Um, I'm speechless about this music that we just heard. I I I. I don't know if I can say much, but I, I think it's an incredible music. And it's not only because it's so beautiful and so moving. Um, I think it's because um, it's not music that the composer has decided he is interested in writing it. This music has um, emerged from a reality that is much stronger than any political decision and any um, 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 intellectual or um, I don't know how to say it's it's music that has to be written. This urgency that uh, I feel in it. Um, I think um, is is what we heard here, and I feel very connected to it because if you would, um, Neil wrote me email um, a, a week ago and say um, I would like you to prepare a presentation and uh, describe or talk about what made you interested in in um, Arabic music and Oriental music. And I think I'm not interested. I am just um, cannot do something else. I mean, they are, um, uh, it, it's not uh, a point in my life that I have decided that I need to do that because of this and this and that. This is a music that uh, we, we breathe. This is a reality that I don't create at all. But I, I'm just living it, I'm breathing it, and it comes out. Um, uh, and then I say, yes, this is what I want. Um, you have to understand, Israel, um, in a way, is like America, but there is, uh, I mean, it's in a place of immigration, people coming from all over the world like in America, and you may under, uh, know it and experience it, but there is something else which is there, and that there is a lot of suffering. 
This is a, it's, it's, a, it's a tragedy. We are living a tragedy, which uh, we are like dolls, like puppets, uh, manipulated by forces. And, um, and I spoke with Muhammad just before we came in, and uh, we said that music is uh, a space where uh, these conflicts can be expressed and be resolved. I mean, in music we have conflicts. There is, uh, you know, even in the sonata form, concerto, we have, but the conflict is contributing to the evolution of uh, a situation, is a positive thing. It's like an um, ancient, ancient like machine or a, an instrument that a lot brings ahead anything. The conflict in the Middle East is something that um, we our people as human being are uh, being um, uh, overpowered by it. And the only way we can uh, go, a place we can go to is art, music. And when I hear uh, a melody sang by a Yemenite, Yemenite singer, or original, pure, and um, I write it down, and I give it to a, um, a soloist in a choir in Germany. That's what I've experienced. I told uh, Tahir about it. I didn't, no note was changed. It was exactly what the Yemenite singer, I just transcribed it to notes, and I gave it to a German singer uh, in a choir, and it sounded like um, Gregorian chant. Now listen to that. Both singers are singing the same music. I mean, this is there was one melody maybe one day in our uh, before anything, just one melody, and it went there. It's like a branch of a tree, and you give it to another uh, 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 singer from another culture, from another. It's just a different accent a different tempo, a different atmosphere. It's colder there. I mean, so many things that change the, the vocal production, and we are completely in another world. What we are doing now, and I think what's our task is, and reality is asking us to do it, is to go back from those branches that were separated, are, are so far apart, apparently, and go back to our origin where Everything works well so, so much. I mean, there's, uh, it's, it's peace there. I mean, there's brotherhood, there is uh, togetherness. And that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Could, could you say a few words about, um, about Makamat? Uh, Makam is, a, is an organizing, and I, feel free to con uh, correct me, um, is an organizing principle and organizing structure in some ways uh, the way raga um, is used for uh, Indian music and something called nusach in, in uh, Jewish music um, not really a template but but a, a, a foundation for melody for um, for harmony and for, especially for improvisation and this work of Betty's is called makamat and I never did ask her if makamat is just plural of makam or if it's a coincidence or what it means is it? It's a plural right. of, okay. of makam, and um, I, I called it because in Hebrew, um, the word makam is a place, but it's also in um, Kabbalistic, um, uh, it's, a, it's, a met, it's a word that we are uh, describing divinity. It's, it's, it's a, sub, it's a substitute word for divine, the divinity, Elohim or Makom. And this combination, because it's a, in this, the piece is a prayer. I, I think all, every music is prayer. All what we are doing in music, we are praying, basically. And, uh, and so that was the, 
uh, about Makamat. Makamat is a, is a collection of five uh, popular songs. Uh, two of them are uh, Yemenite in Hebrew, means it's a Yemenite melody brought uh, by, um, originated in Yemen, uh, sang by, with a text from the Putin, uh, which is, uh, uh, I don't know how to Religious explain poetry. it. Yes, exactly. While there is another Yemenite song that is in Arabic Yemenite, and there is a Bedouin song in Arabic, and a, an Egypt, Egyptian song uh, written by uh, Farid al and um, And the set of it is a classical uh, ensemble, regular classical ensemble, string quintet, flute, clarinet, uh, harp. And um, I wanted the instruments, the Western instrument, classical Western instrument, to sing the Arabic songs along with the the singer, and so they are they are playing this music like the German singer was interpreting without that he even know, knew the the Yemenite uh, uh, original melody. So we've asked Odea Nini. Uh, who is of Yemenite Israeli heritage, but she was born in New York, she lives in Los Angeles, uh, studied at CalArts, and is very interested in, uh, in vocal improvisation and finding new things for the voice to do that uh, we might have thought of as unimaginable not too long ago. And Odea is singing, she will be the vocal soloist in the performance of Makamat tomorrow night, but uh, we've invited her to come and sing, uh, sing one of the songs uh, the first one, actually, and following that, we will listen to the CD of of the um, of the work Makamat that Betty wrote. So we will hear um, we will hear that same song, but then with with the uh, uh, with the interruptions, with the delicious interruptions of instruments um, that surprise and, and delight us. Uh, that uh, that begin about a minute into the into the work. So if Odea would. Uh, would come up. Um, she is going to sing the first of the five songs from Makamat, but in a very special uh, way that she has uh, crafted herself. He Thank you. 
Uh, if we could play the um, about the first minute and a half of the CD of Makamat, um, we will we will hear something both at once similar and very different to what Odea just did. Betty's music. If we can cut the the uh, CD here, thank you. Um, so I'm very happy that you are all here, and I hope that you have some good questions, some stimulating questions, and that might also stimulate our distinguished panelists to ask questions of one another. I, w I wonder if, uh, uh, Betty, you could say something about what is happening there in that example you talked about uh, with the um, musician. Was it a Yemenite musician, and then you... Um, took the notation and then gave it to a German a singer or something like, what, what is happening if it is exactly the same notes in that invisible translation um, that then makes it so different? And, um, and then I don't know if Benjamin, I sort of wanted a quick word from you on the notion Betty said about music is where conflicts are expressed and then resolved. You know, if, if in a larger sense that can be true, given all you've studied, what what is going to happen other than just all this great music that's being made? Is there some larger thing that's happening? Um, what happens is that uh, when, we, when we play music or when we sing it, uh, we arrive to a common land. And, uh, and from there, we emerge with our own accent. I mean, it's all about accent. It's all about uh, pacing that may change uh, a certain melody will be sang by a German singer who is um, tradition of singing for him is singing in a choir, choral, Bach, um, um, uh, Gregorian chants, as I said before. And when he sees notes, that's his world. And, uh, and he gives everything. I mean, authentic. It's his authentic way of, of singing. The same melody probably is not originated in, in Yemen, is a melody. And uh, sang by a Yemen singer with uh, maybe uh, the space, the geographically, I mean, what, what, what it was in front of the first singer who ever sang that Yemenite song. 
created a different accent, a different uh, tempo, a different vocal uh, production. And that's what is the essence of music. I mean, we think music is the notes, C, D, Do, Re, Mi, etc. We all know that it's not that. The message is in between the notes. The message is in the, in the a little bit crescendo there, a, a silence there, a pause there. I can even talk to you and say the same words, but with a different intonation, you will get a different message, right? So these are the things that um, I, I, I'm talking about. But originally, we can connect to anything because originally we all come from the same. It's like we are coming from the same swamp, <laughs> if you want. Okay, and we can connect. I mean, that's how, I mean, uh, uh, we hear this incredible music of Muhammad. It's not Muhammad who wrote it. He, I'm sorry, he did. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he is writing that. something that is all in all us, all inside us, and that's why we can relate it. He's just realizing it. No, I, I, I have something. Th thank you, Betty. I, but I have something to add to that, uh, just because I had the misfortune recently of hearing a group play uh, from score Duke Ellington's Harlem Airshaft, which was unfortunately notated. Um, and uh, of course, you know, we have the recording of, of Duke and, and his band playing Harlem Airshaft, and then you can, uh, you, the, what, what I heard, uh, forgive me, but um, what I heard a bunch of white guys do a week and a half ago um, at Lincoln Center was, was sounded nothing like, like like Duke and his band, I, I think there's much more to Harlem Airshaft than the perfect transcription of the notes and the rhythms. There's the the sub subtext between the notes. It's not necessarily just a Duke Ellington phenomenon. It's not necessarily um, a phenomenon that would apply if I was so, uh, stupid enough to notate, let's say, the late saxophone improvisations of Stan Getz and ask a classical saxophonist to play it. it, it it's something that's much broader than that. Um, and it goes back, of course, you know, to even European music where the music of Bach is um, famously sparse on dynamics, articulations, and all sorts of common details that I wouldn't dream leaving out of my music today, but everyone sort of understood how to play that through a common practice. Um, the last thing I'd add to that is that, go, going back to the issue of makamat, is the most important thing about makam, which is basically Arabic modes or Arabic scales, is the fact that, um, you know, people are often, when I'm, and I encountered this with the orchestra actually today, uh, or yesterday, well, what do you mean by this? Is this a quarter tone that is, you know, or this is this lower? And can you give us, you know, exactly? And I said, no, absolutely not. And that's not just because I'm trying to be Middle Eastern and difficult and contrary. It's because <laughs> of the fact that it isn't exactly the same every time. The microtonal inflections are not the way a, a European avant-garde composer would use microtonal systems. You know, um, it's it's much more intuitive than that. And it goes back to the fact that these microtones make the music so interesting uh, because of the fact that most of our music has not been notated. It's not been notated ever. So, and, and for those of you who are music nerds here, we don't have really harmony. We don't have counterpoint to speak of. We don't have anything in Arabic music other than, than the melody and the rhythm and a drone, maybe, in classical Arabic music, okay? Uh, so you have to think that this is a tradition that has sustained itself for thousands and thousands of years, for an awfully long time, on putting all of their energy into the melodic line and into refining the melody, into, into creating a really, really great tune, and a memorable tune, and a varied tune, and a sophisticated tune, because remember, there's no notation, so the next person has to learn it, and memorize it, and commit it to their ear. You know, and the final thing I would say is David is playing Tahrir on Sunday, and I remember when, you know, um, you know, or in orchestras, we have this famous, famous politics of the 
orchestra managers wanting to fulfill union rules by giving parts to their principal woodwind players or principal brass players if they're gonna do a concerto. And there was a woman who was in a major orchestra who was horrified by the prospect of playing my concerto that I wrote for David, not because she hated me, but she wanted to play the piece, she wanted to play the clarinet in the clarinet section. And David has been immersing himself in the klezmer tradition, it's running fire through his veins, has been since he was 30 years old, and he's never turned back. So if she was to undergo that same transformation, I mean, it's music is just more, it's just more. I don't, I don't know if I can say like more this, more that, more that, it's just more. You know, <laughs> it's not that easy. It's just more. Let me, let me pick up on something that you were just saying, Mohammed, uh, about the quarter tones and the microtonal aspect, and and I will get back to your question about conflict. Um, but before I, I say that, I just wanted to, to uh, say that uh, Odea's amazing improvisation, uh, and then hearing your beautiful setting, and thinking back to Ofra Chaza's dance hit with the same song is, it shows how rich and varied the possibilities of that, that particular song and many other songs uh, are. Was, uh, hearing those three, I had one in my head and the other two here uh, was, was a really rich experience. On the microtones and so on and, and on the conflict, um, in the last album that Bustan Avraham, this band in which Taisir Ilyas was a, a major figure, uh, the last album that they uh, put out they had a new bassist, Naor Karmi, uh, an Israeli Jew who had grown up in Akka, in Akko, uh, in Acre, the, a town that's both uh, Muslim and Jewish and, and Christian and so on. Um, and he had gone to the Jerusalem Academy, uh, where you are now a student, have been for a while, uh, where Taisir has been teaching for since the mid-90s. And he had done the program in Arab music, or is it actually called uh, Oriental music there. And uh, played beautifully. He played with major, major Arab musicians as a bassist or sometimes, yeah, bassist, uh, some, sometimes stand-up, sometimes electric bass. And he composed one piece, Nodunya. Uh, Nodunya is the dowry in, in Jewish custom uh, for, the, for the Bustan's uh, last CD. And it's a gorgeous piece. And one of the Arab members of the ensemble said to him, uh, this was Nassim Dakwar, Nassim said, you know, uh, and Nassim told, told me this whole story. He said, Naor, you've written a gorgeous piece, but your E half flat is the wrong E half flat. Take it from me. Smochalai. You know, just trust me. This is not the E half flat you meant. It's, this is what you've got. So I don't know if you would care to demonstrate for people uh, yes, you know, the difference, you know, <laughs> uh, for Bayat and, and Rast and, and so on. With, you, if you could give us a little passage yeah. that would really help. So that's just so this was a this was a resolution of uh, not an actual it was a conflict of sorts that was resolved in this case by force majeure, but um, <laughs> but also by the the idea that, that this this trust that yes I bring to this a whole bunch of knowledge and a whole bunch of feeling and a whole bunch of ideas and you bring another set of knowledge and here's where we meet and these are the kinds of places where one of us gives to the other. Uh, before I demonstrate, I just want to say one thing about scales in um, Arabic music. I will demonstrate now one scale, it's called Bayat. Um, I will just d demonstrate the difference from, uh, from two regions, which I mean is the, the tone in Arabic music is divided into nine commas, which uh, differs from place and uh, in two different places in the world. So I will demonstrate the same scale, which a Turkish player would write. We have the same notation, the same uh, accidental, this, everything's the same, but the behavior changes and the intonation changes. So I hope, hopefully I managed to <laughs> demonstrate it. <laughs> I will start with the Arabic classical scale, okay. Thank you. 
classical scale of this sort. I will try to do something between Turkey and Iraq uh, with different uh, behavior and different intonation with the same scale, actually. I'm a documentary filmmaker and a passionate interfaith activist. And I frequently give presentations on college campuses and in mosques and churches and synagogues. And I always begin each program with music and end with music. And I always ask musicians from different cultural and religious backgrounds to play music at the beginning to model what interfaith harmony could look like. So I, I'm here tonight and I'm, you know, this is a banquet for me. But here's my question, okay? I feel that more people that hear this music will start to understand, resonate what, what the idea is behind it. But you mentioned, Betty, about being puppets, right? And I ask myself, what would it take? What kind of transformation would we have to have among the general populace of the world for that to be transformed into something political where the politicians, you know, at, at the UN, before they make any, any deliberations at all, maybe they need to hear this music, you know? And I'm asking, wh what do you see in the future? And Ben, you too, you've been studying this phenomenon for a long time. How is this going to be translated into something that in our lives which we can then see that it's happening on a governmental level and not just on the artistic and ephemeral level of, of peaceful coexistence. Well, you know, if someone, uh, if someone ri ri rises in the ranks in politics enough to be actually influential in politics, the chances are they will have numbed their senses so much that they won't be moved by music anyway. So, um, uh, you know, and and I th I think that you've you've cited a great organization, the United Nations, that has uh, been dealt quite a bit itself. So I don't necessarily feel like you know I'm answering your question, even though you didn't ask it to me, because I feel sort of passionately about it. Yeah, um, and it's it's simple. It's just it's a very simple answer that. Politicians are very self-interested people. And they're an organization of people that operate for their mutual interest. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, they're ineffective, okay? The politicians have brokered peace deals between Israel and Egypt and between Israel and Jordan. And those peace deals are completely meaningless other than on the economic level 
and a cold political level in terms of diplomatic relationships, having embassies and consulates and so on and so forth, and doing business and trading hands and having money and having op some, some level of so-called open borders. Um, what I'm encouraged by is, and I said, I said on NPR once uh, that uh, where, where politicians fail, maybe artists can succeed. And I must have gotten about a hundred letters after that, most of them very positive, some kind of threatening. <laughs> and um, what I'm encouraged by is that people seem to have taken a cue out of this. And we're here, we're talking not about politics, we're talking about music. And I'm seeing an increasing number of Israelis and Palestinians meeting Israelis and all sorts of Arabs meeting to talk about poetry, to talk about art, to talk about their culture. It's very, very difficult to dehumanize someone if you understand their art mm -hmm. and if you understand their culture. So if we want a piece of human beings, not a piece of nations, but a piece between people, then the people have to meet each other, they have to understand each other, and they have to do what we're doing on this stage today. Okay, so that's the thing. That that that's the that's the added burden that exists for us as as artists. It's not really a burden, but it's the added responsibility, the gravity of that responsibility. That that we are operating on the human level, not uh, not on the political level. And and I'd like to add to that, seconding what you've said, that that humanity, finding humanity in others. Uh, is a major goal and a major uh, product of such engagements. It can be, but what has struck me following this, uh, the fortunes of, of a no quite a number of musicians and their music over the last couple of decades, is just how fragile this can be. And I'm, I'm reminded of spiders' webs uh, covered with drops of dew that look so beautiful, and you can just, with one swish of your hand, break it, and I saw this with particular bands again and again, that they, no matter how much beautiful music they were making and uh, bringing audiences together and giving them a sense that they share something that they can see into each other's lives, uh, it would just take one uh, attack, one really bloody event, doesn't matter who was responsible, to set everything back again. So, you know, uh, violence can undo things far more quickly than music can build up. But uh, since most of us, I think, are more predisposed to either make or enjoy music than to be violent, I, I think in the end there is hope. But it's, it's, it's definitely not a linear, it, we are all ascending toward this wonderful goal. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that we're that vulnerable. I don't think we're that vulnerable at all. I see this, this sort of talk everywhere today. I see this sort of talk in this sort of so-called death of classical music and that we have, I think Alex Ross is the one who said, we have a crisis in our crisis yeah, in yeah. classical it's music. It's an invented crisis. It's just, we're not that vulnerable. Music is not gonna die. I mean, look, music, you know, people have been talking about composers not getting uh, 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 as many commissions since the financial crisis. First of all, that's not entirely true. Uh, but people have been talking about arts institutions having cuts in their funding and, oh my God, we're going to die. You know what? We just went through a recession. Music has survived. Music has been around since the beginning of humanity. It's been around since, since the beginning, since the first breath we took as human beings. It survived holocausts. It survived, I mean, absolute catastrophes, great depressions. It survived everything, and it's still here, and it's still strong, and it's still our strongest way of communicating with one another. I mean, come on. Let's, let's look at the big picture. On a, on a micro level, okay, it's easy to say, oh, goodness, we're all screwed. On a macro level, we're doing better than we've ever done. I mean, most people, many people in the world today are able to hope for more than just their daily bread. That wasn't true a thousand years ago. I mean, it's not everyone, it's not an ideal situation, but you know, I'm not, it's not, I'm not just saying this because I'm young and stupid and idealistic. I'm saying this because I really believe it, you know, on some level. I was not saying that the music is fragile. I'm saying that the move towards peace is 
and that it, we, I, I believe we will get there, but there are setbacks and that the music can, can build. Um, I'd like to break in here and both um, bring a close to the program and also at the same time um, suggest that, uh, that the party will move outdoors. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you to Claudia Bester again and the, the wonderful staff of The Hammer and most of all to my colleagues that I am in such awe of. Thank you. Thank you.